level and abide forever, right? That sounds like uh, good news to talk to us. And so uh, let's pay attention to this. This is a, a thing that has transformed uh, my life. Uh, the thing that I want to talk uh, to you about this morning has transformed uh, our family's life. And uh, it's just uh, been a good thing. Sometimes I think I've become a, a, a Christian all over again by getting some of these concepts. Uh, and the Holy Spirit needs to reveal this to you. I, I realize that because I'm going to have a tough time articulating what you need to know. Um, so let's just pray right now that the Holy Spirit would come and would kind of uh, open our eyes. Uh, because this is a thing that, yes, I knew all along in my life, but I didn't really get it until the Holy Spirit revealed it uh, to, uh, to me in some way. And so let's let's pray right now that the, uh, the Holy Spirit would um, be able to reveal His truth to us. Thank you, Lord, that you are here with us. We have that confidence. Thank you that you do love us and you care about us. You want what's best for us. And so I pray that you would open our eyes this morning so that we could uh, find uh, victory, strength, and grace and refocus our thoughts, our minds, and our eyes on you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now what I'm talking about this morning, you may say, ah, it's just a head thing. And you're right. It's just a head thing. But a head thing goes pretty far right? So what is faith, anyway? It's just a head thing, right? It's a thing of the mind. Um, when uh, God t uh, tells us to be transformed, what does he say, how does he say to be transformed? How are we transformed? The renewing of our mind. It's a head thing, right? Yep, it's a head thing. Be not conformed to this world. In other words, don't get wrapped up over in this world. But be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's how you're going to know the will of God. You be by transformed. And that's how you are going to know what is good. By being transformed by this renewing of your mind. You know, the re rearranging things up there. Um, because, really, Satan is the father of lies. And sin has affected us in such a way that we don't have things quite together up here. I know we'd like to think it, that we have our ducks in a row, but we don't. And so, we need some rearranging up here, some rethinking, some transforming is what he calls it, to um, be able to prove what is good and acceptable, what's the perfect will of God. Now, we talked about um, the God of the universe and uh, how that he is so big and we are very, I mean, the earth is microscopic. Uh, and, and basically, the, not even in the realm of the universe, but just in the realm of our um, galaxy, the Milky Way. So God is so big. And yet, the interesting thing about God is that he wants to have a relationship with you and I. And he calls that, in the King James Version, fellowship. Okay? That relationship uh, that uh, he wants with you is called fellowship in, in the King James Version. Right? So, whenever you see, uh, see the word fellowship, it's, uh, it's what God wants for us in a relationship with us. Okay? God, we know God uh, loves us because he came down to the earth to die for us. Even though he's this big God, and you know, if something, a little bug irritates you, what do you do? Right? Get rid of it. Or maybe you don't like doing it that way. But you'll, you'll brush it away at least. Okay? But when we've irritated God, 
He, uh, instead of doing that, he wrapped himself in flesh and came down and was among us, just as we are in human flesh. That's hard to understand. He became like us to show us that he loved us so that he, uh, we can be reconciled to him again in a relationship with him. Now, some of these things are sometimes hard for us to grasp. And I, I want to just bring that to you uh, on, on how, um, hopefully I can bring it in a clearer way so that you can grasp the thought. Well, some of my most miserable years in life were back in my high school days, in my freshman and sophomore years. I remember at that time, I had uh, what you would call probably an inferiority complex. I would wonder what he thought of me, and I would wonder what she thought of me. And um, I would come into a room, and if the, uh, if the talking you know, stopped just for a little, I knew, I just knew they were talking about me. And um, I just didn't quite fit in, so I thought. And uh, I didn't think people really uh, got a kick out of me at all. Uh, I just, it was a difficult time. I could say that was probably one of the most miserable uh, times of my life. It wasn't necessarily the most difficult time of my life. Mm. Difficulty, pain, suffering, and even death doesn't mean that you uh, become miserable. Um, in fact, you can have joy and peace and, and um, life during those times. Pain and suffering isn't what causes you to not have joy and peace. Um, in fact, pain and suffering in many times is good for us. And God allowed us to do, uh, do, to do that. So it wasn't that it was the most difficult time in my life. It was just the most miserable time in my life. And um, it was because I had my mind on something that I shouldn't have had. We'll get that, uh, the, the story later. God did work in my life. And, um, and I'll just show you, uh, tell you how that was done. Sometimes I think we try so hard, and yet we have such a difficult uh, time getting to where we want to be. It's like we spin our tires. You, you think about yourself being stuck in the snow. And you spin your tires, you spin your tires, and as you spin your tires, you actually get deeper into the rut. And you actually get uh, stuck worse. And eventually, the snow hits the bottom of your car, and you are done for. You, you're just stuck. You need something uh, to get you out. Okay? We think, you know what? I'm not doing enough. I should, uh, I should be doing more for God. I should be witnessing more for God. I should be reading my Bible more. I should be praying more. You know, I, I, I feel so inadequate, and yet I so feel so out of energy. And, and, and you feel this, this some um, oppression of defeat coming on your shoulders. Sometimes you wonder, how do I know the will of God? How can I even know the will of God? And you feel somewhat out of touch, bewildered, and confused. How many of you have ever felt that way in, in some kind of way? Yes, we all have, I believe. You get to the point where you're tired. And you're tired of fighting, tired of giving, tired of working so hard. And you say, Lord, I can't. And you, uh, and you give up. Some of uh, you, uh, some of us, we, uh, we read our Bible pretty consistently. We go to church. We even do what the church asks us to do. We pray before meals and we pray before we go to bed. 
And we pray some other times also. But we still don't feel that connection with God. Somehow. Why is that? Sometimes life is, feels like a, a, a perpetual struggle, uh, a striving, just an effort, that, a frustration that you're not getting there. And you wonder, is this a striving for uh, this effort? Is that really what leads you to holiness and happiness and usefulness? Sometimes you just long for God to somehow show up. God, if you're real, just make a miracle happen right in front of me, right now. Hallelujah. You've prayed that already, right? <laughs> God, just show up. And so sometimes we long for that embrace to God from God. Something to tell us that he's there. Something to, uh, to show us that we have a real relationship with him. Some kind of fellowship. Sometimes it's so real and yet so often it's so, so distant. And I suggest to you uh, that today that's not how we live a life of holiness. That's not how we live a life of happiness. That's not how we live a life of usefulness. I have to think of Moses. And um, I've probably shared this before, but this, is, this has been a, uh, such a um, thing in my life that it, it makes me want to, to share it over and over again. Moses, uh, you remember, he went to the uh, burning bush. And what did God say that his name was? Mine. I am. I am. I am. Mom. What does that mean? Mama. I am. What does it mean? Well, you fill in the blanks. I am. And then you fill in the blanks. That's what God is. And then, uh, what he asked Moses to do was so incredible, so out of this world, that I'm not sure, it's, it's no wonder Moses had a little bit of trouble uh, committing himself to, to going. The task was enormous, you know, he, uh, God was asking him to take over one million people out of a hostile nation, across the desert, come for a land of hostile people, and settle it. And, you, and Moses would say, God, you're just simply crazy. I can't do that. Take one million people out of a hostile land, take them over across the desert, uh, go into a hostile uh, country, come for the people, and settle it. I'm supposed to do that. God, you're crazy. I think that's what Moses was thinking. And that's when uh, God said to him, what uh, my name is, I am. I am able to do it. Don't worry about it. Just be obedient. Go and do what I tell you. And I'll take care of the rest. And guess what happened? God, through Moses, took one million people out of a hostile land, across the desert, into a, 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 a hostile con a country, and conquered that land, and they settled into it. That's what happened. Because God is, I am. And, he, uh, and Moses could fill in the blank after that. Here is the concept that I want you to understand. 
Jesus, before he went on the cross, had some very important words that he wanted to tell the disciples. You'll find those important words a few chapter, in a few chapters in John. John, uh, I think it's 15, 16, and 17. This is after the, uh, the Last Supper, <coughs> and before they went out to the, uh, the garden, and before he was crucified. You will find these chapters, and they are, I believe, important words to us. I want you to look at John 15. That's what, the one we're going to focus on this morning. Now, I'm not going to just, uh, read this, but we're going to just think about what it's talking about here. Jesus is saying that I am the vine and you are the branches. I thought about bringing uh, something in here, but I wasn't sure where to find uh, a vine. But anyway, you can picture it in your mind. The vine is the main stem and the roots that go down into the ground, okay? You are the branches, you're uh, offshoots of this vine, right? Where do you get your nurture? Where do you get what it takes for you to live? If you're a branch and you're connected into this vine, where do you get what it takes to live? The sap that flows through. The sap that flows through the vine. Now also, in this, all the nutrition comes through Jesus Christ. Think of this. Everything you need, everything you need comes through the, uh, through the vine up into you as a branch. Everything you need for living. Everything. Okay? Everything that Moses needed to take the children of Israel out of Egypt was in that mine and was flowing into his branch. You don't need to suck out of that mine. That mine just supplies that to you. Okay? Now you do have a choice in the matter here. God doesn't force you to be, uh, be a branch. You can be disconnected from the vine. What happens to the branch that is disconnected from the vine? It dies, it's useless, right? It can't bear any kind of fruit. Because it is disconnected from the nutrients and whatever it takes to create fruit in you. You are the one where uh, fruit is is on, right? The fruit hangs off the branches, right? But where does really the fruit come from? It comes from the vine. The nutrition and that and the water and whatever that comes up through the vine and into you, but enables you to bear fruit. And so what Jesus is saying here in this passage, he's saying, I am the vine. Father is the person that takes care of the vine, and you are the branches. And he says that every person that abides in me is going to bear fruit. Why? Because I am the one that supplies you with everything. I am the one that gives you everything you need. Everything you need for every situation in life. Everything for every situation in life. Can you say that with me? Everything, Everything for every, every situation, situation in life. Jesus gives that to you. And so, it's not me, but it's Christ in me. I don't do the work. I only abide and he works in me. You may have some habits, 
that you would love to get rid of. And you see me can't get rid of them. Not I, but Christ in me. I don't kill the habit. I only abide. And he kills that habit within me. I don't end the struggle. I only abide. And he ends the struggle within me. I don't become perfect. I only abide. And he makes me perfect. I don't become sinless. I only abide. And he makes me sinless. There's some verses that go along with this, and, and there's lots of verses with this that, if you uh, that talk uh, about this, in Second um, Corinthians four seven to nine, it says this: "But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God, and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair." Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. And in Galatians 2.20 it says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So it's not about you, it's about Christ working in you, which makes the result. Now sometimes you may think, I respond so wrongly to uh, some people. Think of this, it's not about that other, other person. God said that we're not fighting against flesh and blood. The blood. In other words, we're not fighting against people. We're fighting against other things. Principalities and powers of the air. It's not about the person that you're having conflict with. In fact, he's just something in your life that just came up. But really what you need to do is focus on Jesus Christ. He's on the other side there of that person and he's saying, do it unto me. He's here beckoning and we get our eyes focused on this person and he says, no, 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 look at me. And we get our eyes focused again on that person, no, 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 come on, look at me. Jesus Christ, I'll take care of it. I'll take care of this person. And yet so often we think of the person as being the problem, or our relationship with, with the person as being the problem. In fact, we get ourselves in this mix. And we would like for us to somehow be changed, and yet we don't know how, and we're looking, trying to somehow fix ourselves, and it doesn't work. We cannot, you cannot fix yourself. Okay, I will say, I will concede sometimes, that with your own grit, and willpower, you get some things accomplished. Sometimes. But on the long term, most times not. Because after a while, we wear out. That grit and determination, after a while, you, uh, you can't stand up to that grinding, that friction all the time with yourself. It's too much, and after a while, you wear out. And, um, and, and you give up. That's why um, sometimes these New Year's resolutions don't work. Because we're so focused about ourselves. In fact, you hear so much about dieting. It doesn't work a lot of times. Why? Because we're thinking about um, food. We're thinking about food all the time. Well, that's the right uh, thing that you shouldn't even think about. We'll get to that a little bit later. I'm getting ahead of myself. But we, our focus needs to be on Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ working that in us. This gives us so, uh, uh, a freedom. It's a thing of abiding in Jesus Christ. All we have to do is abide in Him. And He will take care of these things. 
Abide in Christ. Now, what does it mean to abide? Can anyone tell me? If we're supposed to abide in Christ, what does that mean? If this is the answer, then what does abiding mean? Well, read down in chapter 15 a little further. It tells us very clearly what abiding is. Anybody find it? It says, ye shall abide in, uh, in my love. If this. Verse 10. If you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. Very simple. Just keep my commandments. That's what abiding is. Now, sometimes we think of keeping his commandments as keeping the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not, um, but you, should not, you shouldn't lie, uh, all those types of things. And that's right. As a Christian, that should just be a given. It's never right to lie. Simply not. It's never right to steal. It's not. No, that should be a given. What comes to be a little bit more difficult is some of those things were, are not spelled out exactly in the Bible. And it's, if, if we just have our focus on the law, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not um, lie. Uh, if that's the only thing we, we look at and we think, well, this isn't stealing, this isn't killing, this isn't lying, so I can do whatever I want. No, 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 no. That's not obedience. Um, I think of obedience in this way. And, uh, just this past week, one of the uh, couples, or one of the uh, men in our church, went driving through Goodville and saw this uh, lady at a church knocking on the front door, and she had a little baby. And uh, the first thing that popped in his, into his mind is, uh, that lady needs help. And uh, I should stop. Well, he didn't stop. He, he kept on going. And he was arguing with himself the whole way through Goodville. And he came to clear to the other end of town. And, and he's still fighting with himself. He said, all right, God, I'm going back. And I'll, I'll check it out. <laughs> so he turned his truck around, went back. And by then, she was uh, crawling into her car. And he uh, went up to her and she, uh, asked her if she needs help. And she did. This lady was bipolar, had been off her medicine, and so wasn't thinking properly anymore. She was from DC. She had gotten her uh, mother-in-law's car and her baby, and she drove uh, here, and she was totally um, not thinking, and um, was going to try to get to New York, is what she said. She wanted to get to uh, some place where she could stay and maybe get a job and, and um, make a little money so she could get to some friends in New York. Uh, but really, she, she was not thinking of that just simply wouldn't have worked in her situation. And so she really needed help. And uh, through the process, they got uh, uh, some phone numbers from her and called down, talked to her mother-in-law, which she had stolen the car from. And her mother-in-law was a Christian and was praying for her. <laughs> and she kicked, uh, uh, She was praying. The Holy Spirit heard her prayers. Talked to uh, Brian as he was going past that church. Told him to look into that church. Pressed on him until he turned around and went back and helped that person. They took her back to Washington, D.C. that night. That's obedience. 
That's the obedience I'm talking about. The other should be given. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not be killed. That's a given. But the obedience that I'm talking about is cooperating with God. I like to think of it as the word cooperation. You can be obedient and you can follow the letter of law, but be totally discooperative with your employer or with, the, uh, with whoever you're doing things uh, with your parents, whatever. It's cooperation with God. Just cooperate, okay? Cooperate. <coughs> One thing about God is He is a father to us. And just because my son doesn't cooperate with me all the time doesn't mean I kick him out. Of course not. I try to do some things to help him to cooperate. Okay? Uh, that, that's what God does uh, to us. Just because we messed up uh, uh, sometimes, we will not be perfect. You are here you, uh, in, in the human flesh, and God knows that. But when you don't cooperate, he's going to put a little bit of pressure on you to help you cooperate. Okay? He's not going to kick you out. <coughs> oh yes, if you resist and you resist and you resist, God will not fight against you. He will let you leave the house. But he's not going to kick you out. And with this obedience comes the thing of faith. We need to settle in our minds that God wants what's best for me. He does. If I have a problem in my life, I have a habit or something in my life that I do over and over again, and I would so badly want to get rid of it. Guess what? God wants to get rid of that habit in you worse than you do. How's he going to do that? How's that habit going to uh, be taken away from you? He's going to nudge you into this and that. And the other thing, that will clear that habit from you. Okay? And so, if you're not cooperating with God, guess what? The habit doesn't go away. That's simple. That's not hard to think about. And so, it's a day-to-day -day cooperation with God to fix what you would like to get fixed and what God would like to get fixed even more in your life. When we become Christians, we have these desires. We have these desires to, to love God more. We have these desires to serve Him more. We have those desires, and yet something fights against us. We have also our fleshly desires. And it's the uh, cooperation with God that uh, makes this, uh, the, the spiritual desires in us, the, uh, the spirit within us, take over the fleshly things. Now, I said, is this a striving? No. In a lot of ways, this is a, 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 a way to just let the burden off your shoulders. I know, since I've uh, gotten uh, this in, into my mind, and I have to keep it daily in my mind. So, uh, it's not something that all of a sudden I've conquered. But daily in my mind, I have to uh, think about this, that it's not me, it's Christ in me. It's not the striving. It's just this letting of God do this in my life. And you say, well, in Hebrews 11, verse 6, it says, uh, those that diligently seek. <coughs> but without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek. Right? Diligently seek. Doesn't that sound like striving? Maybe you need to look up that verse, because I didn't quote it quite right. What does it say? There's a, he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek. What? Him. That's the difference. Some of us are seeking after 
the fix, rather than seeking after God. We don't want to be a part of this world, and yet we so often are drawn into it, and we are seeking to somehow get rid of that, uh, that temptation. When we should be seeking after God, there's a big difference in that. It's a, a matter of keeping our eyes on Jesus Christ. Focusing on Jesus Christ. This is why it, uh, can, uh, you don't have to be a, a scholar to be a follower of Jesus Christ. It's just a simple faith in Jesus Christ. When uh, God t uh, tells you to jump and plunge, you jump and plunge. I have to think of it uh, with the zip line at Camp Andrews. We just did that not too long ago. I'm not much for heights. And for uh, jumping off of that platform and, and, and right below us is the pavement. That just seems like stupidity in my mind. I mean, why would you jump off this flat, uh, platform, drop for a little bit um, toward the pavement? Why would you do that? Anyway, I have children that would like to do it with me, so I do it. And. Uh, it, uh, I know the cable is going to gra uh, grab me. We know that Jesus Christ is going to take us through this. And yet, the first jump is so difficult sometimes. It's a simple faith. It's a looking unto Jesus. Keeping our eyes to, on Jesus. Focusing on Jesus Christ. How many of you know how to worry? That's great! I'm glad you know how to worry. You know, there's a, 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 this thing of meditation. Sometimes we think of it as some kind of thing that the Buddhists do. So some kind of, uh, I, I don't know, you, you do this kind of thing. We have some kind of uh, picture of meditation. Do you know what meditation is? It's the same thing as worry. Just a little different. Pretty much big difference. Okay, worry is a focus on the difficult thing in my life, right? It's a concentration on it. If you know how to worry, you know how to meditate. Because all it is, all the only difference is, meditation is a focus on God, not the problem. When you uh, focus on the problem, you're worrying. You know how to do that well. So you can meditate. This is great. Just focus on God. Okay? That's meditation. I had to bring that in because that was kind of a, 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 an eye opener uh, to me. When you are worrying, that is an indication that your focus is not on God. Because when you focus on God, you will not worry. Casting all your care on Him, for He careth for you. Because I am His child, I no longer have to worry about the judgment of God. There is therefore now no con condemnation to me because I am in Christ Jesus. I don't walk after the flesh, I walk after the spirit. I no longer have to worry about my needs. I'm going to do what he asked me because he is. there is no need for me to say, what am I going to eat, what am I going to drink, or what am I going to wear? This is what the people of the world think about and are worked up about. But my Heavenly Father knows that I need all these things. And that's my paraphrase of Matthew 6, 31 and uh, 32. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. I no longer am depressed about my failures. How many of you know that a father knows better what the children's problems are than the child knows himself. How many of you know that he has a keener sense of urgency to fix those problems within his child and to resolve them than the child does himself? How many of you know that the father wants to have it fixed in his child more than the child does himself? How much more your heavenly father? I no longer have to strive. I only take his yoke on me and learn the things I need. I only take his yoke on me 
<clears throat> and learn the things I need to do from him because his, he is meek and lowly in heart and I find refreshing rest in my soul because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. I no longer worry about all the I shoulds. I should do this. I should do that. I should pray more. I should uh, read more. I should uh, be more of a witness. Because I am confident <coughs> of this very thing, that he who began a good work in me will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. I cast it to him. And I just allow him to do it in me. I just cooperate. I no longer get stressed out with the decisions of life because I know that he will direct our paths. I started out with uh, uh, the, the most miserable time in my life. <clears throat> when I had an inferiority complex and I was wondering what people thought of me. Do you know what would resolve that? I came to abandon myself. I gave up. I said, I, I told God, I don't care what people think of me anymore. I care what you think of me. You see, I, uh, I got the, uh, I quit worrying and I started meditating. I took my focus off of my problem. I put my focus on Jesus Christ. And that went away. It will go away for you too. Because God wants it more than you even do yourself. And that's the exciting thing. Later on in this chapter, uh, in John 2, that we've been looking at, <coughs> it talks about this. <coughs> Verse 28, and now little children, abide in me, there it is again, abide in me, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. I'm going to go into the next chapter just a little bit here. The God of the universe does this for us. And I'm going to switch versions on you too. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did, it did not know Him. Dear friends, now we are the children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when He appears... We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope is in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. We sang this song last night around the uh, campfire. I was blessed by it. And I'd like to sing it again here in closing. You are my, uh, you're, you are my all in all. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my
Lord, we want to abide in you. Help us to do so. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We can see it. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, <coughs> now we are ready to move into the next one. Election. Election.